also, I just want to let folks know if you have, um, we have, we'll have time afterwards for Q and A questions for the poets. Um, just to mention that. So our third and final reader tonight is Laura Moriarty. Laura's Laura Moriarty's books include *A Tonalist*, which is an essay poem from *Night Boat, Night Boat Books*, also the novels *Cunning* and *Ultra Violetta*. A semblance selected in new poems from 1975 to 2007 came out from Omnidon in 07, and a book called Who That Divines is forthcoming from Night Boat Books. She is the author of 10 other books of poetry going back to 1980. She won the Poetry Center Book Award in 1983. She is a Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation Award winner in poetry from 1992 and also a new Langton Arts Award winner in literature in 1998, and a fund for poetry grant was uh, awarded to her in 2007. She has taught at Mills College and Naropa University, among other places, and is Deputy Director of Small Press Distribution. So please join me in welcoming Laura Moriarty. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary, so much, and thank you, uh, thank you to Catherine and you and to Margaret for uh, and to Crossroads uh, Festival for um, doing this and uh, allowing me to have the experience of my um, Irish heritage, which um, wasn't much paid attention to in my family when I was growing up. Um, it was one of many heritages that I have. I, one of my uh, colleagues is here and knows that I could be reading in the Czech American <laughs> uh, festival if uh, there was one. <laughs> um, and I have an English heritage as well as Irish. And so um, this book um, comes, well, mostly before I wrote this, I wrote uh, all poetry. And it was, so it was the first sort of prose that I wrote, the first novel. And as a novel, it's kind of a series of vignettes. And um, the characters, among the characters are Elizabeth R., Cousin Mary, Sarah Winchester, Sarah Winnemucca. Sarah Winnemucca was a Paiute uh, woman who was important uh, in the 19th century and actually started writing this book uh, in, near Period of Lake at the reservation there, uh, where you can go and stay in. Um, and the book is really about um, the tragedy of being colonized. Once you've been colonized, you pretty much just are colonized, and it's kind of a tragedy, and it's a, like salt in the coffee kind of thing, I mean, way worse. Um, and you'll see. Uh, there's probably something else I should say about it. Oh, one thing I was going to say about it is that on Facebook, I announced that I was going to give copies of it away because I pictured this box of it that I have. However, I couldn't find the box. But I did find a box of another book of mine that's sort of similar called Spicer City, and I brought a few, and um, so I will, people that want them can come and get them. Uh, and I didn't bring my other books, um, and but I actually have the power to uh, say that if you want to call SPD and say that Laura said it was okay, you can buy any of my books and get a 40% discount, which is the staff discount. Uh, SPD is Small Press Distribution, uh, and um, if you just look up spdbooks.org, uh, you'll come to it. Uh, SPD is a, a uh, nonprofit arts organization that's a book distributor. Um, we carry a little over 400 small independent publishers, including 60 members and um, many others. And um, if you're an enthusiast of poetry, you should definitely go check out our site. So the book is called Cunning, and again, it's a historical uh, novel. The two Marys. Her speaking was robust. I'm tired of being treated like the personification, she said, of danger. Or she said, I want to be your final danger. Mary's face was shaped by what she looked for. She imagined a look acknowledging the accuracy of the root. She sought a composure broken and reassembled. We had a series of conversations which began at dawn. The inflexible, the Oregon, the Plutus, the Mary. Elizabeth had stopped looking for him long ago, but she could not stop feeling his absence. 
There was either destiny or destination. It was unknown. Circumnavigation. At times he was all around her like a map of the world, falsely drawn. There were wonderful features on it like El Dorado, the Northwest Passage, the San Buenaventura River drained the Rockies to the Pacific. He literally searched for them. He was sure they were there. Others had no chance but to go, to go on. A scrawled signature replaced the map and was in turn memorized like the one closed in the heart of the adventurous. The light in the eyes of her friend, her distance, her explanation also absent. Her speaking was resilient for all the good it did them. Mary felt she was in a world of people unlike herself. They felt this together. They were citizens of the same country, or each work was a country. They told themselves what they knew and understood about the world. High altitude winds blew the clouds into familiar forms. Was it the jet stream? Was there any point in knowing? Colonization was betrayal. Discovery was meant to supersede the actuality of physical presence, of desire and possession. It did not. The record was thought of as preserved and legible. Interpretation of whatever made up the record was thought of as reading. Writing was knowing but was not enough. It was too late for anything to be enough. Elizabeth felt that they spoke in Mary's language. Each spoke in the logic of the other's syntax. They shared their sense of contradiction. Rust is like burning, she began. Things here are invaded with it. Flames are a common form. Color is relative. Your eyes, for instance, are blacker than mine. Some of the mountains were red. Their iron had rusted. Later there was folding and bunching, pushing up as with a wired bra. The world broke apart and something resembling the new world began to appear. There was a sense of loss. Thunder clouds at one end of the lake, sheet lightning made it dangerous to swim. The other horizon was black and orange. The sand was violet. Neon is just another element, she responded. Elizabeth sent them out to claim the world for her and to keep them busy. She should have kept them at home. Elizabethan sea dogs roaming the world, giving it false names, mapping and reading it, writing it down. She held the cup between her knees. The tea was hot. The milk was warm. The china was translucent. We sat in the shade of a mountain made of shells. Many times the ocean had come and gone. They had found something. One claimed it for the other. They declared their sovereignty over it. They said it was new, but it was known in more languages than it was unknown. I spoke it for them, for him, she later wrote. It was like the unknown because they believed themselves to have come to the future. She said, if you cut my heart open, you will find the name of that place on it. She was possessed by a sense of ownership that could be argued in no court. The desert stretched out before them, the lake beyond that, and then the mountains. 200 ranges between here and the end of the state. And beyond that, another dozen or so, because these are not natural boundaries. The quiet return home. Cryptography. There was a man, D. She at first ignored his claims, knowing them for what they were. But there, two superstitions combined to intriguing effect. They fed each other's illusions. They really were illusions. One season, D wrote, let it confound another, and let there be no creature upon or within her the same. The spaces in the text represented time, pauses in the dictation of angels reported by D. It was not the angels that were false, but the character D himself. There was a flatness to him. Many codes were used during the war which produced Sarah Winchester's fortune, her empire. The men around her worshipped their weapons, believing them to be supernatural, which was true. They were not natural, not of nature, as, for example, was the husband and child she had lost. She didn't lose them in the war, but she had the insight that death and grief are everywhere the same. These were the messages she read. Famously, Elizabeth saw this from an early age. Her father had her mother and stepmother killed. She saw what it meant to be a wife. She saw that she would be a sovereign in a realm where murder was a matter of policy. She hired people who would help her to stay alive. She called both Dee and Raleigh her eyes. She was able, when necessary, to write them off. That the glory of her may be always drunken, 
and vexed in itself. Little was written in a way that can be easily read about the incessant killing that went on in Elizabeth's and supposedly, Elizabeth's supposedly peaceful reign. Gloriana, they said, there was an official attempt to control the image of her, but it was unneeded as there was great joy in celebrating the queen in the imperial language. She embraced the idea of expedient conquest where there was least resistance. She was in it. Luck brought the storms in her favor. The angelic language was not about espionage only, but that was what she used it for. Dee and Raleigh succeeded. They were her eyes. She was in it up to them. We cut out the tongues of our victims, Aristophanes is translated as having remarked in the words. We say they had no language, no writing. They didn't say the things they said. They didn't write the things they wrote about their religion, their way of life, which has given way to ours. The most ancient writing retains vestiges of this early script. Our lives retain vestiges of this life. There are still people being paid to say it doesn't exist. The Drowning of the Saints. It is known that many ships, having successfully negotiated thousands of miles from their home ports, were lost within sight of their goal. The Flying Dragon, the Santa Maria, the Noonday, the Dashing Wave, the Santa Clara, and the San Francisco, all lost. Ned Bright was made of everything that could survive the sea. Lola recognized this in him immediately. She took measures. The customs of these savages, it was later reported of the Irish, is to live as the brute beasts among the mountains. They went among the survivors of the Armada, stripping and robbing but not killing them. It was the custom of Elizabeth's colonial army to burn their crops and drive them into the mountains, and when they came out, to kill them for sport. It was widely believed in the event of an invasion that the Irish would help the Spanish, but predictably, they chose to help themselves. There were, there are, however, lists of Irishmen who served with the Armada. Guillermo O'Brien, Don Corla, Carlos O'Connor, Don Diego O'Dor, Juan O'Cleary, and Dionisio Irlandes. Ned had a way of being everywhere, of having been present and in some way accountable. Confusion in the wildest sense prevailed. Great king of virtues, wrote Maurice O'Sullivan. It was a marvelous sight. Tins, barrels of flour, big black boxes, big white boxes, big boxes of bacon, everything was in chaos. Boxes and chests of every shape and color, not an inch of sand that was covered in wreckage. A quarter of bottles stood up, stodged to its waist in the cakey sand dome. A sentinel, isle of dreadful thirst, broken hoops on the shore at the land, a maze of dark cunning nets. Farther away, chalk scrawled back doors and on the higher beach, a drying line with two crucified shirts. Rings and wigwams of brown steersmen and master mariners, human shells. That was Joyce. So she took him, expecting nothing, willing to scavenge to survive. He was conscious of himself. He lifted and held her suspended. When anyone needed his strength, they would have it of him. He spoke easily and softly. He told these things called jokes. In Sir Walter Raleigh, William Carlos Williams makes the point that Raleigh penetrated, as he says, the body of the queen, but he never did. The possession was hers. It is not possible to get the best of a prince, but it is difficult. Hence Virginia, the lost colony, its settlers had no idea where they were or what they were doing. They believed themselves to be 10 days march from the Pacific over the Tidewater Hills. They disappeared without a trace. Raleigh is said, like Columbus, never to have understood the magnitude of his mistake, but he did. Left over from his relationship with the queen are places and names and a way of looking at the success of an enterprise and of what constitutes the principal story. Similarly, Francis Drake imagined that he claimed the entire continent for his mistress when he landed in Marin County. He didn't know where he was or was not. When he returned, he talked they talked for six hours of his circumnavigation. He gave Elizabeth an emerald crown stolen from Peru. He was knighted and allowed to keep much of the treasure he had pirated from the Spanish. He had burned whole cities for it, in spite of a recent treaty and their demands for its return. It is not the nature of treasure to be returned. The Miwok crowned Drake in what they remembered in their words for the false coronation. 
They imagined him to be the solution for some problem they were having at the time, as anyone might do upon meeting a strange new man, and with about as much justification. Only the ones who stole too little suffer, his crew wrote of themselves. Later in the revenge, he sailed against the Armada, accepting many important surrenders. The Irish Sea defeated the Spanish. The well-known golden hand of the circumnavigation was put on public display until it fell apart. It was then made into a chair for the Bodleian Library in Oxford. In Marine County and in England, but not in Ireland, are bars named in its honor. Individual acts stand out in relief against a grand historical backdrop, but only as a sort of false tableau. The artist, the historian, chooses the gesture. It proves something about the artist or historian's sense of how to design a life, a campaign, an exploration, or a painting. The queen addressed her troops at Tilbury. She said that though she had the weak and feeble body of a woman, she had the heart and stomach of a prince. She heartened them, plate armor strapped to her bodice with her speech. This dividing up of the body still goes on. You may survive, even prosper, with my liver or kidneys, or more obviously, with my heart. <laughs>